All right, let's um, let's get started right on time for the um, last morning session today before you guys uh, are free to leave for lunch. Um, the speaker is um, well. <laughs> the speaker is Robert, who's done pretty much everything. Um, that one could potentially do, so I don't even know how to start introducing him, to be honest. <laughs> um, many of you will have seen him before or have talked to him before, so I'll just, um, let's just ri uh, dive right in and uh, please get started. Cool, thank you. So I've got a, I've, I've time tested this talk and it's too long. I had to choose between skipping out enough bits I thought it wouldn't make sense or trying to fit it in. So I'm going to try and fit it in. We might not get time for questions at the end. Tough. But if we can, that'll be great. So why, why talk about this is probably something that's worth taking a little bit of time to, to mull on. And my speaker notes are not. Huh. Well, that's going to be debugging the slides is step one. Right. OK. Yay. So. Um, I've worked with Chris Armstrong before, and he's the guy that wrote this package that I'm going to talk about today. And Chris is a really good programmer. He's been around for ages and ages and ages. And who here, by the who went to Tommy's talk about connaissance this morning? Right, so half the room. So statistically, we've you're just completely random. That's great. And one of the things that the connaissance talk didn't really touch on is side effects. Um, like, it talked about how things can be linked. But when you think about reasoning about a program, side effects is kind of the thing that makes it impossible for you to tell what your program is going to do. And Python, it's an imperative language, it is entirely about side effects. There is nothing you can do in Python that doesn't sort of have that feel to it. And that makes it really hard to reason about Python programs at scale. The small ones are really, really easy. You look at the program, you figure out what it does. As soon as it gets slightly bigger, that gets kind of hard. And so he wrote this library to start bringing some of the things that have been done in the functional programming world to Python programmers. Because like me, he loves writing in Python. He does it as his day job. But there are better ways to do some of the things we do. Unfortunately, they aren't available in Python. So I'm going to give you guys a test. What's wrong with this code? What's the bug in this code? Yeah, yeah, just. No. It is entirely legitimate. That's just reveal.js doing something a little bit wacky. <laughs> so yes, the highlighting is wrong. That is not the bug with the code. Tom? Um, I was going to say, like, it assumes English? The yeah. code assumes English. OK, it's not, um, it's not accessible. It's not diverse. I don't care about that for this talk. <laughs> Brian? Side it has a side effect. Right. And this code will actually, what would you expect this code to do if standard out was not able to be written to. What would be the correct behavior for such a trivial program? The correct behavior would be to trace back and exit non-zero, because that's what processes that fail to do their job are meant to do. They are meant to do something like that. <laughs> Fantastic. It works. It's exactly what you want. No, it's not. That simple program does not actually meet the contract of a POSIX process. It doesn't exit non-zero. Now. There's a Python bug for that. But this is the simplest example I could come up with undefined behavior in Python. Writing really, really rigorous code in Python can be quite hard. And this talk is all about trying to figure out a way of doing that that is Pythonic and tasteful, performs reasonably well, and doesn't make us all actually want to switch languages because this is just so much worse than, yeah, right? So let's, let's see if we can get somewhere interesting about this. Things that can cause these side effects for us. Global state, yay. Um, my slides just did something unexpected. It must be written in Python. No, I'm using reveal.js. Bad, bad, bad joke. So what went on here? No, I don't know. So um, if you look through the program I did before and you just try and break it into little, little bits. If you've ever looked at Python bytecode, this is kind of a no-brainer for you. But what it's really doing is it's looking up in a global the name print. It's marshalling some arguments to it. It's calling it. It's looking up sys.standardout inside that function. Another global. That could be defined to do anything. It's part of the power of Python. It's how things like mock work, that you can switch out names at runtime in your tests and have it have completely different meanings. And you actually then call the right method. And then the output gets buffered. If you haven't changed anything else, if you just run that code, your output hasn't been written to the socket. File descriptor whatever. It's still sitting in your process. 
then Python exits. And it goes, oh, I've got a file descriptor here. I've got something in the buffer. I'll write that out. It fails to write that, and then it starts to clean itself up. And it's got nowhere to go. Can't run any more Python code. Your code's already finished. There's a bug in the interpreter. But if you want to test this code and be confident, how do you test that? You have to run a separate process because you're testing something right in the boundary conditions. And that's just really, really ugly. So if we ignore that, mostly, we could monkey patch stuff in. We could provide a new definition of print. And then we're only having to reason about the code that's in front of us. It's very local. It's very easy to think about. I can say, yes, that code does exactly what I expect it to do. Because no one is going to change global state on me. No one is going to run me in a context I didn't expect to be run in. But that is exactly where the bug came in. You could run it in a sub-process, as I just said. You could redirect the I.O. You could run it in the same process, but move the file descriptors around. And that would give you kind of a, a bit of both worlds. It's not as bad as monkey patching, but it's not as comprehensive as running everything in a sub-process and really being absolutely sure. Um, so if we wanted to fix that code, that kind of looks like fixed code. We get rid of our assumptions. We get rid of our globals. We make everything explicit and visible. We can reason about it. I know it's going to write to exactly that file. Yes, there's still a global there, but I know what global it is. Anyone reading it, even if they don't know the exact definition of print in the standard library, can see what that's going to do with a bit more fidelity. And we're going to flush it. We're going to say we care that this has actually been written somewhere before our code finishes. And if we do that, we get two tracebacks because of, it's a long story. <laughs> it's not that long. We still have the data in the um, socket when it exits, and because our flush fails. So it got into the file descriptor buffer. We tried to flush it. It failed. It's still in the buffer. Then the pr Python itself exits, and it's still in the buffer. So we get two tracebacks. One of them, a full traceback. The other one, just the exception, which is all the interpreter can do. But we have fixed the bug. Okay, I've now fixed the simplest, shallowest bug ever. It still wasn't super nice to test when I look at that. And I want to talk about Haskell now, because I like talking about Haskell. I don't know anything about Haskell. I'm an enthusiastic experimenter in Haskell, but I'm not actually an expert. Um, but one of the things I find most striking about Haskell, particularly when I try and talk about its benefits to people who have heard of it and heard of you know, this wonderful thing called monads, is it has all these terms to solve problems that Python doesn't have. A monad is a way of getting data dependencies across pure functions, and that's not a problem Python has because we're imperative. So trying to pick up monads and using them in Python is a bit, a bit crazy. Uh, and the reason for this is that Haskell's pure math. It gives us huge amounts of rigor in being able to think about a program, and the sorts of side effects we saw here are much harder to create in Haskell. But um, you're not actually telling the program to do anything. You're telling it how to calculate something if it were to decide to do it. And it might decide to do it at some point before the heat death of the universe. So this here is actually equivalent to this Haskell code. And it's kind of ridiculous, right? What I'm trying to show here is that in an imperative language, I can set up something that doesn't matter. Like that this is what I mean by trying to solve a problem we don't have. Um, but I want to talk really, really quickly through. Um, who here does know Haskell? Right. OK, so I'll, I won't skip it. Um, so in Haskell, this greater, greater, equal is an infix function, just like plus is in Python, and it's called bind. And it binds two things together, and it creates that data dependency. And it does that by creating a lambda. So on that slide, the backslash is equivalent to the Python lambda colon thing, where you create a function right here and now. So it creates action one bind to a function which takes a parameter called x1 and is going to have a body definition. So the arrow says the body is off on the right. Um, action two is going to be bound to a function that takes a parameter x2. And that's going to pass x1 and x2 to action three. And all of that's just going to be evaluated as a function. It's a whole lot of boilerplate to be able to just write three lines of code. Um, so if you try and translate that straight to Python, it's just it's mental. So 
you've got two lamp two inner functions and you start out with the other side and you have to evaluate the function all the way down um, but actually this is a little bit wrong because the dispatch in Haskell is polymorphic on type and um, the bind function is polymorphic on the, on the left hand argument. So we don't have this monad context. And you could go and create one. You can create a monad class and you can create a binding unit and there's a thousand of these on PyPy and I'm not going to add to that mess. Um, but you end up with something that looks maybe a bit like this where you pass the monad into all of your functions because you don't have that capability that Haskell has of sort of having it as context and you pass one and two and we return the two together. Okay, so that's all cool, but this is not feeling Pythonic. If you guys are looking at this and going, well, no wonder I don't like learning Haskell, this is because this isn't a Pythonic approach to the problem. But it does have a couple of redeeming features. If you were to think about that initial program I started off, which had a side effect and it did some lookups, all of these things could be broken out as separate steps and they could be tested. You could control the interactions with global state very, very precisely if we were doing this. So maybe there is something we can get at that's valuable from this thing, which is you know seven times, eight times the initial code we started with. And that's testability. Now, I don't know about your experience with Python, but my experience with Python is that if it's not tested, it's not a question of if it is or is not broken, it's a question of when it will break. Um, and that is in large part due to the things that make Python powerful. The mutability, the ease of expression, and the fact that you don't have to go through a long, tedious compile, force the type checker to be happy at every step along the way. You, the flip side is you find out that the type checker would have told you about the problem. Now the problem is that um, that's still, if you go back to that code there, that's really not code you want to look at and test because everything's nested, you can't get at those inner functions, you can't really pull it apart and, 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 and control it easily. So the other related thing, sorry I'm, I'm jumping slightly around my slides, is actions can do anything. So you can still have all the global side effects, you can't really control it. I mentioned that and here's a better title. So. There's a thing called the free monad, and the free monad lets you put a language, a domain specific language, and write your own interpreters really, really, really easily. But again, it's a monad which is solving a problem we don't have. But the technique, that technique could be very valuable. And Chris did that with effect. So the free monad says you create a language to express what's going on. So I'm not going to talk about the Haskell side of it anymore. That bit's gone. You can start breathing again. You create a language to express actions. Now, actions can be um, actual physical I.O. or they could just be you're changing the global variable. Or if you wanted to go down to the like finest grain possibility, you could even do just things like looking up names in your global program state as an action. Like, you can completely disconnect your Python code from global state using this approach if you want to. So, this here is an intent. It's the intent of printing a line. So it's just a simple three line class. It doesn't do anything itself. It's what goes into your language. You build your structure. This is what is going to be going on. And you write some pure code. And by that I mean code that itself doesn't interact with the rest of the world. You give it a given input, you get the same output every single time. So when you test it, you don't get a surprise in production because your tests don't have anything that can trap you up and trap you and make it break. You can return a generator, which will let you treat this as a coroutine, or you can return an effect object. And, um, and you might, for something very simple, just return an effect, but when you start wanting flow control and loops and so on, I find it's easiest to express that using generators and coroutines rather than returning callbacks, funks that are going to chain onto other things. And that's I think because the boilerplate gets in the way. Generators are great for avoiding that sort of boilerplate. The function accepts a single parameter, which is the intent that it's going to action. Um, so you, you write an interpreter. Sorry, the, the, yeah, so the output value, everything gets threaded through the interpreter, and so that single value 
is you, you, it doesn't do star ags or keyword ags. So you pass a dict of your parameters or, or whatever you need to be communicating amongst your program parts. You write an interpreter, and the interpreter is the bit where you encode the actual real, there is something happening here. This is where your IO happens. This is where you can talk to a random number generator. And this is where you can consult global variables or whatever other things are appropriate for your production environment. So this here, print and flush is my um, actual implementation of the print intent. That's the thing that evaluates it. And the interpreter object there is a composed dispatcher. So the dispatcher is something that takes uh, intents or, or effects and hands them off to executors and glues it all together. Type dispatcher is something that does that based on the type of the object. Because this is kind of part framework and part solution, you can actually write your own dispatches that would dispatch on rather different things. Um, and one reason you might want to do that is because you wanted to glue it onto async IO or tornado. It comes with a synchronous thing, so you can just write normal code, and a twisted thing, so you can write twisted code using this. But it's written so that it's very, very easy to port to many different frameworks. Uh, Eventlet would be another one that you might want to write your own dispatcher. Um, and the base dispatcher here is the one that knows how to deal with generators, regular functions, and all the sort of boilerplate that you'd kill yourself if you had to recreate it every time. And that isn't really doing global state. It just understands how to map from one type to another. Testing this is actually quite, quite interesting. So we just write a different interpreter. We write an interpreter to use the thing in production. We write an interpreter for testing. And the interpreter for testing that's where we avoid all of the I.O. We avoid all of the expensive stuff like talking to disk, and we avoid all of the things that can cause confusion, like global state, by putting that into our test interpreter. Um, so test print says, um, I'm going to get some outputs. Sync performer, that decorator there, says that this is going to execute this code synchronously. I'm not going to be going and returning a twisted deferred or anything like that. So the particular interpreter is tied to the execution model. So if I want to write stuff in Twisted, I would write Twisted Executors. And all I'm going to do when I get that print effect is I'm going to pull out the uh, line, sorry, the print intent is I'm going to pull out the line parameter from it and put it onto my outputs. And then in my test, I can inspect that. I say I can't assert here in the general case, because while I could write an assertion in this def perform test function here, if I was throwing five or 10 or 20 different lines at the user during my program, I would have one perform test function here, and I can't write a t an assert that's going to handle all those different inputs without it becoming really hard and unreadable. So it's kind of easier to just accumulate everything that goes on and then write, I've moved my mouse, haven't I? There we go. And then write a, um, so I, I have to create a dispatcher that will dispatch out to that. And so that gives me my test interpreter. I perform it synchronously. Note that uh, perf sync performer and sync perform, terrible names, and we'll get to some much nicer stuff in a second. Um, and then I look at the outputs, and I, I write my assertions here. But obviously, we want to be able to do a bit better than that. Um, however, we have fixed all of these things. I did not need to monkey patch my program. I did not need to use subprocesses. I did not need to use IO direction. I need to test my production interpreter once and only once. I might test that using subprocesses and pay the cost there, but all the rest of my code, however big it gets, I'll never need to go and touch that thing again because I've exhaustively tested this bit that has all of those nasty complexities. And that code was the production API. So the, if I go back over here, this is production code, the real print function and the program method there. It's not beautiful big code, because I'm trying to keep really tiny examples for us, but it is production. A little bit awkward with some of the closures I needed to do when I was testing it, um, but not terrible. I could write quite a few tests that way and be quite happy. And in fact, I have ad hoc almost exactly this in the past, trying to solve these problems with programs that are getting a bit big and a bit slow to evolve, and you want to sort of get your velocity up. So you just go, OK, I'll fix the thing right in front of me. Now, if we get time, I'll come back and talk about some more Haskell stuff here, but not right now. There is, however, a dedicated testing API. Yay. So it's got this thing called Sequence Dispatcher. 
And oh, one of the fun things about writing this talk is that as I went through the talk and I went to Chris and I said, hey, this is a bit hard to use, he went and fixed things. So this is the third, maybe fourth iteration of the talk when I filed a bug and he either accepted the bug or the patch as, you know, depending on how far along I'd gotten the, the, the evolution of the thing, and it got better. But I thought we'll show you the path we go through. So sequence dispatcher makes this much, much more straightforward. Each intent is going to come through and it's going to look it up and match it. So did I put, I think I managed to skip a line there. So print is going to be compared by a quality here. So the print object I wrote will fail because two different print objects with the same line parameter are not going to be equal unless I implement Dunder EQ. But what I can do is turn it into a named tuple, at which point it has all of those methods for me and I don't need to ever think again. So the first thing is make your intents named tuples. Makes your code smaller, easier to read, and it works with the testing API in a really nice way. And also makes it clear that you're not going to put complex functions on those intents. They are buckets for passing data around between bits of your program, not actual classes. You'll have classes, you'll have real objects, but they'll consume those things rather than being combined together. Um, the lambda none there says, I don't need anything back from this performer. Like, it's not like a read function where I'd want to return some strings. This one, it's going to be doing a print. It's not going to return anything. So my main code, the, the main function I had right back at the beginning is going to print this thing. It's not going to try and evaluate the result. Sequence.consume there is going to, oh, I know what happened. Yes, OK, you're getting the final API. Um, no? This is the intermediate one. Sorry, I'm sorry about this. Uh, it is what I expected. So OK, this is going to work through that list of things and dispatch them out using sync perform. Um, so with sequence.consume, what that does is it creates a dispatcher out of that sequence that's ready for use. And so you can then see sync perform sequence. So it's kind of the same object. It might be nicer to have it be a context manager. And um, anyway, so this is the name tuple bit that I said just before, so I can skip past that. And this is what the thing starts to look like if a bit bigger. If I wanted to be able to read something in, I'd create a, a read line name tuple. And I have to define a production implementation of it, so sys.standardin.readline. And I have to update my dispatcher. So this is one of the costs. Your Interpreter has to be expanded. Every time you add a type that you're passing around, you have to tell it how to work with that type, that intent. Um, but I can now write a more powerful program. I can write a program that prints something out, and if it succeeds, I want to read it back in, and then if that succeeds, I want to print it back out again to you. Does that seem like Pythonic code, though? Yeah, so some people were asleep, and some people shook their heads, so that's good. So this is how you might write a test for this. And this is using Hypothesis. So it's just throwing random data at it. Um, it will throw a whole bunch of stuff and see what happens. It's a wonderful thing. Look into it. Um, but it's the same testing style. I create a sequence. I create some objects for it to compare against. And I check that they executed. Sequence.consume also checks that they all executed. If you just it ran through half of your, your program would be buggy. And so it will flag that as an error and fail your test. Um, mm -hmm. Right, loops. So this is the generator API I wanted to talk about before. You, this, I think, is Pythonic code. I yield the effect of printing what is your quest. My, I get a line back from the yield because you can use it to get values out. And that is the effect of read line. And then I'm going to yield that line back out to the user. It's a little bit more boilerplate than just doing it as three direct functions, but it doesn't have all of the huge mess of boilerplate that we had before, and it's in exactly equivalent. So I can run the same test and it will pass, but I can also make it a bit simpler by using this thing called Compose Dispatcher. Well, I have to use a Compose Dispatcher because um, I had a generator, a new type in there. So that was going to use the ba bring the base dispatcher in for me. Loops. Sorry, I'm, I'm rushing slightly now because I've gone over time. Um, so if you want a loop, it's really hard with that callback-based approach, where I return the thing, I do the dot on. I didn't really explain it because it just looks like line noise. This here, I think, is pretty clear. While I haven't got the line I want, 
ask, prompt the user, ask for the line back, and at the end of it, print out uh, another question, what is your favorite color? So this is obviously not a complete program. I haven't written a full quiz here. Um, again, I use a hypothesis test to generate test data for me. The bits that I really care about are going to be static, and it's going to say, what's your quest? Read the line. I'm going to deliberately give it um, a, a different quest. That's the, the random thing coming from hypothesis. And then I print, what is your quest again? I give it the line it's looking for to seek the holy grail. If you go back to my loop here, to seek the holy grail is the thing I'm looking for. And we can continue. Um, returning from generators, this is a bug. I'm going to discuss this with Chris at length. I haven't had time yet. Um, you have to re yield do return, which it just looks for as a wrapper to say, oh, that's not an effect to pass on elsewhere in the program. Actually, I think we can fix this so it doesn't need to do it. There's a comment in the code and the docs that says you don't need to do this on Python 3. The code actually requires you to do it on all versions of Python. So I believe the intent is there, and there's just a certain amount of, of figuring out that we need to do. Um, and this is the newest testing thing he added. So perform sequence. You just give the same sort of structure, but you don't need that with sequence.consume, and you don't need to worry about closures. It returns the result of the full thing out the end of it for you. So you can see you know, your program return this value, or this function acted like a function and gave you a value back, and then you can write regular asserts against it. So I think it brings together all of those things in a fairly nice and straightforward fashion. Um, yes, I have got three minutes for questions. <laughs> Wow, um, that was certainly a very interesting talk. Um, thank you, Robert. We uh, do have a few more minutes for questions, so um, I'll just be coming around. Um, how is it used in PIP, or how have you found using it for real? Um, so this is currently not used in PIP, but it is something I think might be a good fit for some of PIP's problems, because PIP is all about I.O. And some of the bugs we have are all, all about I.O. This is used in Otter, which is a Rackspace uh, auto-scaling thing. So you have a, a heat cluster that's be, a cluster that's been defined and managed by heat, but you want to throw more machines and more capacity at it when you have lots of load coming in. So it's heavily asynchronous. It's got external state that it has to synchronize against, which is the actual state of the cluster, and I.O. that can go wrong in every single way you can imagine because it's a distributed system. And they're using this. They're slowly increasing the areas within the code that they use it. Um, because it's got the sync perform and the async perform and the, the idea of these um, interpreters, you can embed it in an existing program in a very small way. Like you can put just this little bit here. Decide if you like it, and then glom things on around it or put it in another island over there and just add it, add to it as it makes sense. Any other questions? You guys should use the time that's available. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask a question of you guys. Does this sound interesting or are you regretting choosing this room? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> right, so I thought um, the question was a bit harsh. <laughs> that provocative. Might, but provocative, okay. Um, no, it definitely got me thinking about, um, you know, Python at scale and what you run into and the awareness of it and um, things you have to think about and try out. And so I wouldn't use it because there isn't kind of immediate need, but um, definitely interesting input. Cool. Um, yeah, it was an interesting talk, a little bit uh, fast for me to actually take all that and to actually ask you any sensible questions afterwards, but I'm sure it's something I'll have a look at in my own time later. I'm here all day and, and tomorrow, and I'm happy to be approaching the hallway track. There's another question up to the right behind you. Yes, I think I have one question up here first. 
I was going to ask you if you will commit to running a tutorial next year on this because I think there's lots of people here who are interested but maybe need a bit more time and some I'd practical examples. I'd be delighted. Um, yeah, that gentleman up there is I think probably the last one. Is there any facility for separating different kinds of effects and supplying um, different interpreters for different families of effects? For example, I.O., state manipulation, and so on. Um, so you want to have two different interpreters and you want them to cooperate with each other when some uh, an effect of one type is encountered, go through that, and it's, yes, the composed, so the interpreter is the dispatcher. So a composed dispatcher takes an arbitrary number of dispatches and tries one and tries the next and tries the third and tries the fourth and so on. So we're beeping. Um, so all, yeah, all you need to do is to have one um, dispatcher for each family of effects and then use a composed dispatcher that's appropriate for your, your combination to join them all together. Very straightforward. So um, very last question, if it's a quick question. Um, yeah, my question was more, isn't that creating a new language and shouldn't you use a functional language in the first place if you're solving problems where that makes sense? Uh, no. So. So ye yes and no. Yes is creating a new language. So is Eventlet, Twisted, Async IO, um, Tornado. So are DSLs of any sort. You create new languages every time you create a language to talk about something, whether or not the syntax has changed. So you're absolutely right it's doing that. Is this one one that lets you mitigate some of the things that the there by default language in Python gives you and that gives you good bridges to there by default language? I think it is. I think going to Haskell for an existing code base is a very expensive proposition, and going to Haskell for an existing team is a very expensive proposition. Now, will it pay off, and how long will it pay off, and is it the right thing to do are hard questions to answer. Is separating out your I.O. and your global state manipulation from your code that you can look straight in front of you to reduce your connaissance and to give you better results from your testing and less unexpected surprises in production, I think it is. So I think this can be a good thing without any impact on the question of moving to a different language, a, a, a completely different interpreter, you know, like Haskell or whatever. Okay, anyone who's going to the uh, PyLadies lunch, um, the group is already meeting outside, so you would have to leave uh, right away. Um, other than that, please join me in thanking Robert again for his talk. You're welcome.